come to the table. This February 20th, 2020, regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the national anthem by the Centerville High School Wildcat Guitar Ensemble under the direction of Bill Burke. Isn't that a wonderful way of hearing the national anthem? Bravo. In order to comply with Section 2.2.3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the Board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on February 20th, 2020, and to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the Board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion made by Ms. Derenak Koufax, seconded by Ms. Omesh. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. The motion carries. We are now certified for our meeting compliance. A few other announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information is on the table by the auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to the school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under the upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select board, uh, school board from the full menu, then click on the watch live button on the school board meetings webpage. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. I now call on Ms. Boateng for an announcement. Read Across America Day, March 2nd, 2020. Education Associations, what, National Education Associations, NEA, Read Across America, now in its 21st year, is an annual reading motivation and awareness program that calls for every child in every community to celebrate reading on or around Dr. Seuss's birthday. This year's celebration is based on the theme, All Are Welcome Here, sends a clear message that our public schools are a place where every child is welcome and encourages students to delve into books to learn as much as possible while becoming lifelong readers. In cities and towns across the nation, teachers, teenagers, librarians, politicians, actors, athletes, parents, grandparents, and others develop 
NEA's Read Across America activities to bring reading excitement to children of all ages. National Foreign Language, Language Week, March 4th through March 10th, 2020. This week of March 4th through 10th, 2020 has been designated as National F Foreign Language Week. The Alpha Mu Gamma Foreign Language Honor Society has sponsored National, National Foreign Language Week since 1957. And the theme for 2020 is, with languages, you are at home anywhere. Schools are encouraged to use this opportunity to highlight the value of language the value of learning world languages and learning about other cultures and to celebrate the successes of world languages, language students and teachers. And also before I hand it back over to Ms. Corbett Sanders, we have a couple of scouts in our midst from Troop 1978. We have uh, Lila Cant Cantor, Libby Root, Charlie Root, and Jake Tribble. Could you guys please stand to be recognized? Thank you. I now call on Ms. McLaughlin for a recognition of the National Social Work Month. Good evening. Uh, before we begin the presentation, I would like to prompt our technicians to please show the video. Before I read the uh, formal recognition, I do want to take a moment as uh, the only social worker who's been on the school board for the last eight years uh, to just tell all of you here in the audience and particularly our social workers who are joining us here tonight that it's such an honor and a privilege to represent the profession. Uh, joining the board eight years ago was my goal that we would look at how we truly educate the whole child. And to do that, it is paying attention to the social, emotional, and psychological needs of our students to ensure that they have food and shelter and the supports they need to be academically successful. And so as I read this recognition that's so well-deserved, I just want to personally express my appreciation for things you do every single day to really support our students. That video was amazing and spoke to all the marvelous things that you do every single day. So here we go. March is the National Social Work Month, and School Social Work Week is March 2nd through the 6th. This year's National School Social Work Association theme is Beacon of Hope, School Social Workers Light the Way. School social workers are master's degree professionals who are trained to examine and address life's challenges in a holistic way. They have expertise in many areas, including mental health, human development and behavior, trauma, and family systems. School social workers are needed now more than ever as they invest their time and skills to promote equity and address barriers to learning. They, are, they increase student and family engagement by fostering positive relationships and creating hope and opportunity for youth and families in need. 
School social workers facilitate skill building and strengthen support systems to help students cope, problem solve, overcome barriers, and access resources to become sex successful and productive young adults. Social workers tackle some of the toughest challenges facing our society. In every city and every community, they develop solutions to increase access to both mental health and physical health care, reduce poverty, eliminate injustices, and protect vulnerable children from harm. School social workers are a valued member of our school's multidisciplinary teams, working with school faculty and families to provide coordinated interventions and consultation that's designed to keep students in school and help families access the supports needed to ensure student success. They promote a positive school climate and culture through a trauma-sensitive lens to maximize student learning. School social workers in Fairfax County Public Schools use their training, their experience, and their skills to provide services to our children, our families, and our school staff members in an effort to remove personal and environmental obstacles for optimal student academic performance. They are committed to helping every child achieve, promote academic success, and mental health wellness for all. And with that, I would like to welcome Mary Jo Davis, who is the head of our school social worker team here in Fairfax County, as well as all of the social workers that are here with us tonight for a photograph with the board and our superintendent. Thank you for your service to our schools.
So now I call on Mr. Frisch for the recognition of the National Athletic Training Month. I'm a mess. All right. I did not fall down the stairs today, though, so that's a good thing. All right, thank you. Uh, March is National Athletic Training Month, and this year's theme is AT's Impact Healthcare Through Action, an appropriate slogan reflecting the important role certified athletic trainers employed by Fairfax County Public Schools play in keeping our students safe. Through educational programs for students, parents, and coaches, preseason sports screenings and emergency planning, these nationally certified and state licensed medical professionals are dedicated to promoting the health and safety of our student athletes before, during, and after practices and competitions. The athletic health care services provided by certified athletic trainers include the prevention, recognition, evaluation, treatment, and rehabilitation of athletic injuries and illness. FCPS continues to be recognized as a leader in adolescent injury epidemiology, research, and sports-related concussion management for high school athletes. Our athletic trainers work collaboratively with parents, school staff, and community medical providers to promote safe participation for over 27,000 athletic participants each year. In fact, during the 2018-19 school year, over 9,200 individual students received care from an FCPS athletic trainer, accounting for almost 74,000 total visits to our 25 athletic training facilities. FCPS is nationally recognized as a leader among high school athletic training programs. In 2017, each FCPS high school was once again designated as a first team safe sports school through the National Athletic Trainers Association, the second time all 25 schools have been recognized in this fashion. At this time, I would like to invite John Reynolds and the athletic trainers who are here this evening to please join us at the dais for a photo with the board.
I now call on Ms. Derenak Koufax for the Women's History Month resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I am honored to read this resolution. Whereas March is Women's History Month and this year's theme, Valent Women of the Vote, marks the 100th anniversary of women winning the right to vote, we honor those valiant women of the past whose struggle for women's suffrage began in 1848 at a women's rights convention held in Seneca Falls, New York. Leaders Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott started a movement that would spread across the country. Opposition to the movement was harsh, including many suffragists being jailed, some locally in an old prison in Lorton, Virginia in 1917. And whereas Susan B. Anthony, one of the most, most well-known suffragists and honored today on the $1 coin, traveled the country giving speeches to persuade people to support a, women's, a woman's right to vote. Virginia's own Ellen Glasgow, an author who won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature and is the namesake of our own Glasgow Middle School here in Fairfax County, was also active in the suffrage movement. And whereas Alice Paul led demonstrations, went on hunger strikes, picketed the White House, and was jailed for her efforts, her tactics helped publicize this harsh treatment of the suffragists and were a reason that in 1920, the 19th Amendment was finally added to the Constitution. Despite this achievement, the movement continued as barriers cr were created to make it nearly impossible for African Americans and Native Americans to exercise the right to vote for years later. And whereas today in Lorton, Virginia, a memorial is being built to honor all suffragists, especially those who endured harsh conditions, abuse, and imprisonment. It will be called the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial and will open on August 26, 2020. This area is also home to the Lucy Burns Museum, which has many artifacts and exhibits honoring suffragists. And whereas, as many of our students approach the voting age of 18 and look forward to casting their first ballot, remember that 100 years ago, casting the ballot would have been illegal for women. So let's remember their sacrifices and give thanks to Ms. Stanton, Ms. Mott, Ms. Anthony, Ms. Paul, Ms. Glasgow, and all the valiant suffragists whose names you might never know, but those who won the right to vote in the United States. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board, on behalf of the Fairfax County Commission for Women and all its residents, hereby proclaim March 2020 as Women's History Month and a time to remember and honor the countless women who fought relentlessly for the rights of all women in our great nation. I so move. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Cohen. Ms. Derenak Koufax, do you want to speak to your resolution? I do. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I shared this story last year, but, but it's really personal to me, so I, I just wanted to share it again. Um, like many of my colleagues who were, when they were first elected the board, there's a lot of emotions that you feel and you feel a, a, a great deal of responsibility. Um, so when, when I was first elected eight years ago, I found myself due to another commitment at the Lorton Workhouse. And as I was touring the workhouse facilities while waiting for my daughter, I came upon a one room history museum. And this museum, as I mentioned in the resolution, chronicled how suffragettes were incarcerated and force-fed during hunger strikes. It was not a huge display, but the impact it had on me at that moment in time was monumental. And as I read the stories and saw the displays of the suffragists and how they were humiliated, how they were treated inhumanely, I became very emotional. These women did this for me. They did that for my daughter. And not only so I can vote, but so I'm a woman that could be elected to office to have a real seat at the table. I felt like I really wanted to speak to them and to thank them. And it was a moment of recognition to me that was really quite unexpected in an afternoon where I was merely trying to pass the time. I share this story with you because it's imperative that all of us take the time to remember and honor the women who paved the road before us to thank them and to reflect on how it might be had they not been so courageous. 
In this vein, FCPS, in collaboration with the Fairfax County Commission for Women, are providing to our schools a brief history of these valiant suffragettes, and we are requesting that all schools in FCPS read about this history during the morning announcements during the month of March. I want to thank Emily McCoy and your team of Helen Cole, Felicia Woods, and Jane Mentera for suggesting this action. And I am also hopeful that during March, many of our teachers will incorporate into their lesson plans the recognition, observance, and celebration of women and the vital roles women have played in American history and how we will continue to make history. Ms. Cohen, would you like to speak to your second? I would, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Derenak Koufax, for this resolution recognizing the important role of these women in history. Along with the amazing contributions of Ms. Stanton, Ms. Mott, Ms. Anthony, Ms. Paul, and Ms. Glasgow, I also want to mention the contributions of women who often get overlooked in history class. Jewish women like Bella Abzug, who famously reminded us that a woman's place is in the house, the House of Representatives. African-American women like the Leesburg Stockade Girls, who, while Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, sat in a jail cell in America's Georgia for over two months for trying to buy movie tickets at the front entrance instead of the back. They ranged from 12 to 15 years old. Latina women like Dolores Suerta, who has spent her life improving the working conditions of not only farm workers, but some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Muslim women like Dr. Hawa Abdi, one of Somalia's first female obstetricians who saved thousands during Somalia's civil war and along with her daughters, continues to protect and educate survivors. Lesbian women like Sally Ride, an engineer, physicist, and astronaut who as the first woman in space entire, inspired my entire generation to reach for the stars. And trans women like Lynn Conway, an electrical engineer and computer scientist who revolutionized chip design in the early 80s, changing the entire paradigm of who had access to state-of-the-art technology, yet was fired from IBM for transitioning. Their history is our history. Their fight is our fight. And on this Women's History Month, we recognize all those who continue to struggle for true equality 100 years after we finally won the right to vote. Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, thank you. I just want to echo um, the remarks that uh, my colleague, Ms. Dernat Koufax, and uh, Ms. Jane, Lord Jane Cohen had shared. Um, having uh, grown up not just in a family of three girls, uh, but also uh, being so close to my grandmother, who grew up in Casper, Wyoming, and. Uh, knew firsthand, um, having um, been born in 1925, what it was like listening to her mother uh, talk about what it meant for votes for women. And uh, as someone with a degree in American history, having studied what it meant um, that even for those of us who have reached um, half a century in age or more to reflect on the fact that it was not even 100 years ago um, that we were told as uh, a collective group that we just weren't appropriate for, for having the responsibility and the capacity to vote. So this anniversary um, that we face here um, in 2020, I think resonates um, very deeply for, for many of us. And, and I am very mindful that uh, the men in this country, I think share our appreciation and, and tremendous gratitude for uh, the women who fought for this right to vote, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And uh, I will close with this as someone who sometimes with her passion, it gets the better of me. But as we know, well-behaved women rarely make history. So to the women who made history 100 years and more ago, thank you. And to um, all of my colleagues, along with Mr. Frisch. Uh, thank, thank Thank you for continuing to bring the message that we value each and every individual um, that comes through our doors and that we're here to celebrate this great milestone um, that happened 100 years ago. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Thank you. I, um, 
appreciate it. I'll, I'll keep my remarks brief, but I couldn't let this one go without saying a few words. As the daughter of a woman who in India in the 1960s was one of the first women ever to get a PhD in computer science at IIT Delhi, the seventh woman there, and as the mother of a daughter who is the first ever female team lead of her, uh, developer team lead of her project team at her university, I'm really proud of, of what women have accomplished. But those two statements make me realize that there's still a lot that women need to accomplish and we need to recognize that we still have a ways to go to achieve true equity and equality for women and we shouldn't lose sight of that and be intentional in our work um, and in our um, in how we talk about gender equality not just where we've come from but where we still need to go and I just want to say one last thing to the Women's Commission. I really appreciate the work the Fairfax County Women's Commission has done. My daughter was actually a student representative to the Women's Commission when she was here. So I appreciate the work that they've done in bringing the women's history to our school. So thank you for being a partner here on that. Thank you. And with that, I will call for the vote. All those in favor of the resolution on Women's History Month for March 2020. That is unanimous. The motion carries. And now if I could ask the members of the Women's Commission, um, please come up for a photo with us on the dais. Thank you. The next order of business is citizen participation. Tonight, eight citizens have signed up to address the board. 
Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to no more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program budget and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to those appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that there are often young children in attendance at these meetings or watching at home, so language should be appropriate for all age levels. Thank you for your cooperation and thanks to those who have come to speak with us tonight. Our first speaker is Lenny Wolf, followed by Tina Williams. I've been a Fairfax County taxpayer for 30 years. Both of my children graduated from the school system and have done very well in their careers with the preparation that they received here. I come today to make two points. The first, is to voice concern over an action item from last Monday's work session on the family engagement policy. It says the school system is to provide a draft of a systemic approach to external stakeholder engagement. In the session, the school board asked the school system to reach out to external activist groups in developing the policy, implying that these groups have a stake in how our school system engages with the families of our students. In the discussion, the school system highlighted the time that it takes to engage stakeholder groups in developing policy. In developing the family engagement policy, I believe the school system should only be engaging students, families, and their teachers. I do not support using taxpayer money and school system time to engage with activist groups on this. These groups don't live here, and they only represent their own national political interests. They cannot speak for our families as they cannot know the individual context and situations of the people who live here. These activist groups are manipulating your policies for their own interests. My second point is a concern over the proposed renaming of another school. I do not believe taxpayer money or school system time should be consumed by this effort, which causes more divisions than it resolves. I think the school system and the school board should focus on educating children in what they need to become productive adults in secure facilities and not focus on what's in a name. Thank you for listening. Tina Williams, followed by Emily Vanderhoff. Good evening, I'm Tina Williams, President of Fairfax County Federation of Teachers. I'd like to wish you all a very happy Black History Month. This month is a critical time for reflection and I'd like to highlight several opportunities the board has to help shed the vestige of Jim Crow. We urge our school board to adopt Carl Frisch's amendment to support employees' rights to collectively bargain. Virginia is just one of three states that bans public sector workers from the freedom to collectively bargain. And it's no coincidence that the other two, North Carolina and South Carolina, are also Southern states. Other states' anti-worker policies, our state's anti-worker policies are largely a vestige of Jim Crow. Workers in the South were prohibited from organizing for the, the same reasons that slaves were prohibited from learning to read to keep people of color and poor people from having power in numbers. In honor of Black History Month, we ask our school board to be on the right side of history and to join 47 other states across the country by supporting collective bargaining rights for public employees. Collective bargaining preserves the educator's voice in public education. It ensures that the view from the classroom is represented in decision-making. It will help our students in schools 
Research has found that school districts with bargaining attract and retain more accomplished teachers, have more equitable treatment of workers of different races and genders, make workplaces safer, increases employees' sense of well-being, and yields better student achievement. This is particularly important for FCPS. The latest employee engagement survey found that many employees are overwhelmed. Teacher working conditions are student learning conditions. We urge the board to enact FCFT's FY21 budget demands for increased staffing, protecting planning time, and revamping the student discipline policy to help address these concerns right away. FCFT also stands with the NAACP in urging the school board to rename Lee High School. We should not honor slaveholders and defenders of slavery. Children of color and their families should also feel proud, respected, welcomed, and included when they walk into a school. Taking these actions will help our students and teachers have a voice, make our community safer and more inclusive for everyone. Thank you. Emily Vanderhoff, followed by John Zarrow. Good evening. My name is Emily Vanderhoff, and I'm a first grade teacher at Hunt Valley Elementary School. I'm also a proud member of the Fairfax County Federation of Teachers. I'm here to ask you to vote in favor of Mr. Frisch's amendment that would remove the restric restriction on collective bargaining in the Fairfax County School Board State and Federal Legislative Program and add language in support of employees' right to collectively bargain. I appreciate the message of support for, for collective bargaining that I've been seeing from Mr. Frisch and other school board members as legislation on collective bargaining has been moving through the Virginia General Assembly. As some of you may know, and as Tina mentioned, Virginia is one of only three states that explicitly bans collective bargaining rights for public employees, and there is currently legislation being considered that would remove this ban. Allowing for collective bargaining would benefit Fairfax County Public Schools because it would allow representatives of Fairfax County employees to work together with district leadership to create the best working environment for employees and the best learning environment for our students. We know that resources are limited, and we would like to work proactively and collaboratively with the board and district leadership to problem solve how to best use our resources to meet our greatest needs and provide the best learning experiences we can for our students. Our district leadership is great at seeing the big picture and pushing for broad ideas and programs that would benefit the school divisions. Teachers and staff can provide district leadership with a window into the day-to-day -day realities of our school buildings. We know how district-wide initiatives are being put into practice and how resources are used or not used or greatly needed but unavailable. The perspective we add to the conversation can provide district leadership with information that can't easily be seen through broad division-wide data or short school visits. When we work together, we can make sure that all the choices that we make will be the best use of our resources and will have a direct positive impact on the well-being of our students and staff. I hope that you'll vote in favor of Mr. Frisch's amendment. Thank you. John Zaro followed by David Broder. Hi, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the one Lee Kepard and her son, eight years old, and I basically I just wrote everything down. I'm just gonna read from it, if that's okay. Um, I'm just speaking on her behalf, so she's addressing you. So um, my name is Zun Lee Kepat. I'm a single mom. My husband deserted the family when my son was only three years old. He did not want to take that responsibility. So in, uh, I moved to Fairfax County in the summer of 2017, and I moved to McLean House. And I chose that location because it's very close to elementary school for my son, and it's very close within a one minute walking distance to my job location. I wanted to make sure that my son is secure. And since we have no family here, he's the only one that I got. I wanted to make sure that his welfare is taken care of and he is near me and I can take care of him after school. So the bus situation was, he will get dropped off and come immediately to my 
workplace where I can care for him and feed him and teach him and uh, spend the rest of the day. I work long hours. I'm a hard working mom. I don't get off at 9, sometimes at 10. He's, at least I know he's staying with me, and we go home together. We, were, we had informed the school of our new location, and we were told that we have to move to Westgate, which is three miles away. And, we're in that, and we are financially unable to handle anything else. That's why we were approved for the program, the, the, the school uh, free lunch program. We were approved of that because of their financial difficulty. And just, having that, just thinking about leaving her son alone in that other school three miles away, it's unfathomable. And she cannot, it's just so difficult situation. She cannot leave the work and go take care of her son. So we were asking, we contacted them, we tried every different way, we threw email, we contacted the board, and we helped her, I'm a church member, we just helped her as, you know, trying to be a good Samaritan, help her out, and, but basically to yesterday, or the day before, they asked her, you have to move, I mean, we don't really, basically, you move, this is not your base school, and you have to move, middle of school or not, middle of the school year, you have to move, and that's the difficulty we're facing right now, we're asking if there's okay, if he can stay in that school where he can be safe and close to his mom and where he has all his friends and he's been there already for two and a half years. That's our request for this exceptional situation of there. And he's very close and tired to his mom. Like I said, they have no family in this country at all. And he's only eight years old, as you can see. I brought him on purpose so you guys can see them. So that's basically what we're requesting, if he can remain in that school. Thank you, Mr. Zarrow. Thank you so much. We have David Broder, followed by Larry Little. Good evening, members of the school board, and thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. My name is David Broder. I'm a Fairfax County resident. I'm the father of an FCPS student, and I'm the proud president of SEIU Virginia 512. Our union members are your county employees. Uh, they are librarians, our park staff, our mental health workers and nurses, and I'm very proud to stand here in solidarity with my sisters from FEA and FCFT. It takes all of us to make this community work. If we're going to make sure that every child and every family has a great future, then we need excellent schools and we need excellent libraries and we need an excellent health care system. And so I'm here tonight to ask you to support restoring the freedom for public employees to collectively bargain. When our employees, when our firefighters, when our nurses, when our educators have the ability to come together and have a seat at the table, we all win. We can work together to bargain for good jobs for all working families. We can work together to bargain for the smaller class sizes that we hear so much about and need, to bargain to ensure that our first responders have access to the safety equipment they need, to make sure that we have safe staffing ratios in our healthcare centers. That's what this is about. And uh, we look forward to this vote tonight. As my sisters have mentioned, Virginia has a shameful history when it comes to workers' rights. One of just three states that ban workers from sitting down and bargaining a contract. And so it's no surprise that Oxfam America has listed us as the worst state for workers two years in a row. Not reflective of the commonwealth we want or the community we want. The good news is we can do something about that and you can lead the way by supporting unequivocally the right to collectively bargain. Um, and again, as was noted, there is a shameful legacy here that we know right, that the public sector often was the one place that people of color and women could get jobs, that they did not face quite the same discrimination as the private sector. And so it is not an accident that the voices of public sector employees in the South for too long have been silenced. It's a direct attack on women of communities and color. And again, a way that we can end, we can start to address some of the shameful legacy uh, uh, of our commonwealth and make our community stronger for all. I'll end by saying this. 
I'm here tonight to talk about collective bargaining because I would not be here tonight without collective bargaining. My grandparents were union workers. My mom was a union teacher. As a kid, we had food on the table and we could see a doctor and we never had to choose between the two because my mom had a great union contract. We want to make sure that every family in our community has the same opportunities that I had. Thank you very much. Larry Little, followed by Kimberly Adams. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm a, an FCS, FCPS PE teacher right here at Luther Jackson and also at Rocky Run. Um, and I'm also a proud member of FCFT. And I've spoken before you guys a couple of times. I want to start by thanking you all for your service and time and effort and energy on behalf of the kids and families and teachers here in FCPS the board, your staffs, the superintendent's office, your staff. Um, it's uh, a big job, and we do appreciate it. I'm here to speak in favor of the Mr. Frisch's amendment about collective bargaining. Just a couple of quick comments. I'd like to echo what you've already heard from my friends and colleagues. I support everything I heard them say. No teacher becomes a teacher to get rich or famous or powerful. Um, so to be in favor of collective bargaining, um, none of those things are the goal. We want a seat at the table. We want to be considered in the discussion about making decisions that affect students and teachers. Um, we've devoted our lives to this. We think it's critically important, and we feel like we ought to have a voice and a seat at the table. Thank you. Kimberly Adams, followed by Bob Wood. Good evening. Repetition is something that makes everything stand together. My name is Kimberly Adams, and I am speaking as the president of the Fairfax Education Association. And I want to begin by telling you how much we appreciate your willingness to consider a positive message about collective bargaining as part of your legislative agenda. Having the right to collectively bargain would create a pathway toward a true, robust employee voice in FCPS. Only two other states in the nation prohibit collective bargaining for employees. As you've heard, 47 other states have successfully implemented bargaining processes to work with their employees for the greater good. States with strong bargaining history have smaller class sizes, more engaged employees, safer buses, lower attrition rates, able to attract and retain staff. With so many vacancies in FCPS and across Virginia and nationally, the importance of educator voices is not going to be overstated. Bargaining provides a method for identifying the challenges, designing and implementing the solutions for the betterment of student learning. We know that our teacher working conditions are our students' learning conditions. And that when conditions are poor, it's a barrier to student success. Educators need strong pathways that currently exist to push for better condition, conditions and fair treatment. The public that elected each person on this dais is highly supportive of the right to bargain. 63% of Virginia voters support the right of public employees to join together and negotiate for a better life and stronger communities. The work that FEA has always attempted to accomplish through its members in our meet and confer process has often been obstructed over the decades, even ignored. The system is broken and the best fix is to restore collective bargaining back to Virginia. You have said that your employee viewpoints and input are appreciated by the school board and we must be taken seriously. The FEA looks forward to working with you in designing a collaborative process. We thank you for your commitment in working in solidarity with the Fairfax Education Association and your employees. Bob Wood. You already said it. My name is Bob Wood. I taught social studies at West Potomac High School for 26 years. In my current role with the Fairfax County Federation of Teachers, I have talked to and interacted <coughs> with teachers in more Mr. Wood, yes. do you mind getting a little closer to the speakers? That would be the good. Microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Should I start over or can I continue? Okay. 
I've talked to and interacted with teachers in more than 150 elementary, middle, and high schools in this county. From these conversations and my own experience, I have come to believe that one of the most acute problems in public education today is the disconnect between the classroom teacher and every layer of the administration. Teachers and administrators inhabit the same physical space but largely exist in two different universes when it comes to decision making. Some building principals and assistants are supportive and invaluable. However, too often the expertise of teachers is, are overlooked. In the role of evaluators, administrators are not necessarily well schooled in what effective teaching looks like. Collective bargaining would give teachers a seat at the table in decisions regarding school practices. Year after year, school systems purchase prepackaged programs that claim to significantly improve student achievement. These programs are rarely, rarely have sufficient teacher input, nor are they tailored to meet the individual individual needs of different schools. When these programs are selected and implemented without teacher input, they are often unsuccessful and or counterproductive. Elementary school principals, uh, pr uh, teachers especially, still need more time to plan, coordinate with each other, and trade best practices. All classrooms must be safe, nurturing, orderly havens for students learning not only their ABCs, but the social skills necessary to navigate their world. Classroom management and discipline may be the biggest challenge faced by many teachers and administrators. It is imperative that teachers and administrators work in concert when it comes to discipline policies and enforcement. We need to help each other. Local boards of commerce and right to work advocates raise the threat of strikes if collective, if collective bargaining is implemented. Jimmy Hoffa is not headed to Virginia. Mr. Wood, thank you so much. <laughs> One more sentence. I took 30 seconds, okay. three seconds right, from you, so I'll you. let you go ahead with your last sentence. Go ahead. <clears throat> Unless teachers are involved in determining school practices at the beginning of the process, school systems will continue to operate less effectively. We need a seat at the table. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. So that uh, completes our speakers for this evening. I'm now going to call on Ms. Boateng for student representative matters. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is staying warm because it's been very cold lately. Um, so I'm just gonna give a rundown of what's been going on since the last time you guys seen me. So I've had a series of meetings with multiple people and groups. Uh, they had an SAC meeting, if, for those who don't know, it's the superintendents student advisory council meeting yesterday, and we were at Langley and it was a very nice session. I actually went to Poe Middle School's NGHS meeting today, right before I came here, and it was really fulfilling because, well, who doesn't like talking to other people? Like, I really enjoy being able to speak in front of them, and actually, a lot of what I say here is what I told them. And last Wednesday, I went to the minority student Achievement Oversight Committee meeting again, and every week, every month that I go there, I learn something new, and which is why I continue to go. So that, in addition to other sprinkles of meetings with individuals, in the future I'll be I will continue to be meeting with more school leadership classes. I've been doing that throughout the year, and once again, it's really fulfilling because I get to meet a bunch of like-minded individuals and students who really care about the county. Earlier this year, I mentioned the Fairfax County Board of Student Representatives, which is basically a group of the student representatives to the collective um, advisory committees, school board advisory committees. So we meet monthly. 
to discuss mental health among our students. And we will be meeting with various mental health specialists throughout the county and along with the National Alliance on Mental Health, NOVA. And we are meeting with these people to become more educated on what's going on, like the mental health things that are provided in our county, resources, and also find ways to continue to push um, to get those resources more noticed and make sure that everyone knows that these resources are available to help our students in our county because some people could, like a lot many people describe the climate of our students, like the mental health, they call it a crisis. And it's important that we highlight it and make sure that our students in our county are well and that they know that they are cared for and that people care about them and that we care about their well-being. That being said, now that I've given you guys the where I've been and where I'll be going, it's time for me to talk about next year. So student representative elections will be happening soon. So this is kind of interesting for me to be saying because I'm here. <laughs> and, but the reason why I bring it up is because applications will be released pretty soon. And elections take place in April and I encourage parents, teachers, APs, everybody, if you know of a student that would be a good candidate, please forward whatever information you may see to them. I love what I'm able to do and the opportunity that I have, and I love doing it every single day. And I look forward to passing it on to another person too. And to any students that are listening, if you are passionate, which you should be, about what goes on in our county, or you know of another student who is, I encourage you to apply and to try it out because you never know what could happen. I can promise you this time last year, I did not think I'd be sitting here right now. So there's huge importance in student voice and student leadership in our county. So I always push it. And because eventually there'll be a time where I'm not sitting on this dive, which is so sad, but I'm excited for whatever the next person has in mind, and as always, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or just want to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boateng. I now call on Mr. Frisch for an amendment to the state and federal legislative plan. All right. Uh, I move to amend the Fairfax County School Board state and federal legislation program originally adopted by the previous school board on October 24th, 2019, by striking item four under item H, employer-employee relations. The section being uh, stricken is for the FCSB opposes changes in code or the constitution that would limit the supervisorial authority of local school boards, particularly as it relates to binding arbitration or collective bargaining. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Keyes Gamara. Mr. Frisch, would you like to speak to this amendment or do you want to wait for the second one? Uh, I'm going to hold off until we tackle the replacement. Ms. Keyes Gamara, do you want to speak to this one? I'm patient. Okay. So, with that, I will call for the vote to amend the Fairfax County School Board State and Federal Legislative Program, originally adopted by the board on October 24th, 2019, by striking item number four under item H, employer-employee relations. All those in favor? That is unanimous. The motion carries. I now call on Mr. Frisch for an amendment. I move to amend the Fairfax County School Board State and Federal legislative program originally adopted by the previous board on October 24th, 2019 by adding a new item under number one and renumber its uh, items one through three under item H accordingly. Uh, the new number one would read, the FCSB supports granting authority to local school boards to recognize the right of employees to enter into collectively bargained agreements that value and balance the needs of employees with the educational mission of the school division and that preserves the constitutionally protected supervisorial authority of the local school board. And then the subsequent items are renumbered. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Keyes Gamara. Mr. Frisch, would you like to speak to your amendment? Sure. So what we're voting on tonight is reversing uh, our position in our legislative package. 
which is used uh, by the school division in lobbying for legislation in Richmond and Washington. Um, and we've just voted to remove our previous opposition to collective bargaining, which I think is uh, a statement in and of itself, especially since it was unanimous. By passing the amendment that we're discussing now, we are recognizing as a school board uh, that collective bargaining of our employees is a right uh, while maintaining our authority as a school board to oversee those responsibilities. Um, we ask our teachers to work together uh, as professionals, we ask them to plan together, we ask them to learn from each other together, um, we ask them to sub for each other. Um, the least we can do is allow them to work together in bargaining for uh, their uh, agreements with this school division. Um, in Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas, they have collective bargaining for public employees. As has been previously stated, Virginia is one of only three states that does not have such a right. Washington, D.C., and 47 other states do. Um, at a time when so many teachers are leaving the profession, uh, we need to have a competitive advantage uh, in the marketplace. And allowing teachers to, comp uh, to collectively bargain together will give them a sense of responsibility over their own destiny, um, as well as a voice in the process that decides the reasons that people become teachers in the first place. The sales pitch around teaching for a long time has been, it's a great job. You just don't get paid very well. You don't get the benefits that you probably deserve for the hours put in. Um, you probably don't get the respect that you feel that you deserve, but please come join us. And we wonder as a society why people are not flocking to the profession. These types of changes change the job description or the job sales pitch. You would now have a seat at the table when it comes to the type of job that you will have. Um, we have a good relationship with labor on this school board, and we have a collaborative relationship with labor as a school board. Um, studies show that when employees, regardless of whether they have a good relationship with their uh, employers or not, when they do have the ability to collectively bargain, there is less turnover. As we've all learned from the various work sessions that we've had, turnover plagues the teaching profession, especially when it comes to young teachers uh, who are uncertain about their future, who are uncertain about their retirement. Um, my father uh, was a union cop, and I grew up in a middle-class family because he had a union job. When he was injured when I was about 10 years old, I remember him not being able to work, but we still were able to stay in the house for months on end without worrying about it being taken away. Um, when he retired 20 years ago, there was no worry that his retirement was gonna dry up and that something bad would happen in his later years. He still lives comfortably retired today. Um, if we pass this amendment, my understanding is that we will become the first school division in the state of Virginia to put a line in the sand saying that we stand for the right of our employees to collectively bargain. I think that's something that we should be proud of. I want to thank uh, Chairman Corbett Sanders for working with me to uh, bring this language along to a place where we can find uh, agreement on the board. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues uh, for joining me and standing up for our employees. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Keyes Gamara, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, my colleague, to my colleague for giving me this, this opportunity because um, I said yes, because this is consistent with, I believe, the core of who I am. I come from a family where my grandfather was in the union, my dad was in the union, and my first job out of law school here in this area was to fight for the rights of union workers across the nation, truckers to be precise. I, as part of my background, it's important, I understand the importance of workers feeling that they not only have a voice, but that they are respected and valued. And that's what this language does. And I believe that it is high time, well, actually it's probably beyond time for um, this board to join its voice in the fight for workers' rights. I do believe strongly in collective bargaining. 
and I believe that it evens the playing field and it helps us to join with our teachers, our staff members, all of the folks who are in the trenches on the front line as partners in our quest to take care of our students and provide for their best interests. Certainly, I believe that it will improve our community, it will help us in competitiveness, and will help us to maintain and yes, even improve uh, our ability to have a world-class, world-class professionals in our schools. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity and I want you to know that for many of us, this is at the core of who we are because we simply cannot provide what we need to provide as a school system without our front line. And so this is a way of recognizing who you are, how valuable you are, the respect that you deserve, and giving you the voice that you so sorely need in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keyes Gamar. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Um, I will be brief, but I do want to share that as a former teacher who had the benefit of being in a union and had the opportunity to have a seat at the table in order to ensure that there were rights provided for staff, which also means that there were better opportunities provided for students, I am thrilled to be able to be on this side to support this amendment. Um, thank you, Mr. Frisch, uh, for bringing it forward. And I am very happy that as a collective, we are unanimous in our, well, at least two, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here. But in terms of removing the other piece, um, I am thrilled that we are in support of this um, amendment. It is about time. It is, like Ms. Um, Keys Gamara shared, it is long overdue. It is time to ensure that our teachers are feeling as valued as we say they are every single day. We say that, I think this time, we are showing that. So thank you. Ms. Marin. Teacher working conditions are student working conditions. That's what Ms. Williams said tonight. For me, my number one priority is teachers, reducing the teacher overwhelm. Um, if, if collective bargaining is what teachers need, then that's what we're, we're delivering. Um, we just can't expect our teachers and staff to ha carry the burdens that we ask them to without at least meeting their, some of their needs. Uh, just last week, I was in Richmond meeting with our delegates and senators to ask them to support bringing collective bargaining not only to Fairfax, but to Virginia. So I'll say hello tonight to Richmond, to our colleagues there, because we are sending a crystal clear message to you about, um, about what we need for our teachers from one of the largest employers in Virginia. And for others out there, uh, this is proof that elections do matter. Local voting does matter. And um, it's a thrill to be here and be able to put forward action that those of you who helped elect us um, to follow the public's wishes. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you very much. And I first want to say thank you to Mr. Frisch for bringing forth this amendment. It, it is, as Ms. Keys Gamara said, the core of who many of us are, including me as a proud member of a WVMF AFT number 6554 union. Myself, as a college professor, um, teaching for an online class in California where I have the benefit and have seen myself the benefit of being a union member in terms of my salary, in terms of access to um, insurance benefits when I am not on contract as an adjunct professor. So um, I just wanted to say Thank you very, very much. And I see the difference between that and the other teaching job that I have, which is not unionized. And so I, I firmly believe that we have a quality of teachers because of our union where I teach. And I think that will be reflected here in what we are able to do in Fairfax County. I think we'll be able to hire and retain world-class educators. And the key to having a world-class education is retaining world-class educators. So I am thrilled that we are able to do this. I'm thrilled we're able to send a message to the rest of Virginia that we are listening to the 63% of Virginians who believe in collective bargaining for public sector employees and that we are here to lead, lead our state in what's right 
for our teachers and our employees. So thank you to Ms. Keith Gamar for seconding this. Thank you to Mr. Frisch for bringing this. I am honored to be able to support this today. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, not only do I want to thank um, Mr. Frisch for bringing this to the board so that we do have an opportunity to bring our voice to the table uh, as the General Assembly considers this historic change, uh, but I also want to thank um, FEA, FCFT, and everyone who was here speaking tonight uh, to also bring your voices um, to this important issue. Uh, I know that for the past eight years, it's been the commitment of this school board to partner as much as possible with our teacher associations, not simply on issues like pensions and uh, teacher pay, but as was also noted, uh, workload issues and concerns so that uh, Fairfax County continues to be one of the best places for people to enter into the uh, teaching profession. Um, my own father left teaching after about 15 years in what should have been a 30-year career uh, because it simply wasn't feasible to support our family of five. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the teachers in my school district uh, went on strike uh, because it simply the pay was not enough. And I knew those teachers. They were like family members. These were people who were deeply dedicated. And when the strike was over, um, they went back in the classroom and taught with the same degree of passion. But they also knew that um, they were going to be compensated for the hard work they do every single day. So I consider collective bargaining should be viewed as a positive. And the fact that Virginia, being one of the most uh, wealthiest and sophisticated states in the United States, and has languished on this level. Um, it's my understanding that only North Carolina and South Carolina remain. Uh, I look at this as being a, a great step forward for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I hope the General Assembly is successful, and that I also hope everyone in the public understands uh, that it should be welcomed uh, when we signal that employees having a shared voice means that the community as a whole benefits. And most importantly, we do believe it's going to be the students. And for anyone who has concerns about this action, I uh, suggest you uh, do a, a uh, internet search on the state of Wisconsin um, when they uh, put uh, state legislation in place that took away collective bargaining. Um, there was a dramatic impact on not only teachers leaving the workforce, um, but also the hit that it, um, teachers took in terms of their pay and benefits. So uh, the data is out there, and this is the right thing to do. Ms. Cohen. I'll join the crowd in thanking Carl for bringing this up um, at a really key time and reminding us of the flexibility that things that happen in October um, don't have to stand for the remainder of a session. And I'm grateful for you reminding us um, that we still have power while things are happening and aren't um, married to things that past boards necessarily did. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I just wanted to say we live in an amazing commonwealth. And that commonwealth has been built by our workers, by our school staff and teachers, our janitors, our law enforcement officers, our EMTs, our firefighters, our healthcare workers, our hotel workers. We are great because we have built this commonwealth on the backs of people who are willing to work to do whatever it takes to put food on the table, to take care of their kids, and it's time that we take care of them. So I stand in solidarity today with my colleagues and in solidarity with everybody who makes this commonwealth the amazing place that it is, so thank you. Ms. Tolan. Um, yes, as a um, longtime certified teacher and someone that has had the um, privilege to spend a lot of time in our schools, particularly here in FCPS, and to note the incredible professionalism and dedication of our teachers and the rest of our staff, um, I just wanted to say how happy I am to um, this evening be able to you know, back up this uh, resolution and uh, stand with our teachers and you know show again that um, how strongly we feel about bringing our teachers and staff to the table 
Um, as was mentioned earlier, the current board has a very good relationship with our um, teachers and our unions, and this is just a, a way to actually, you know, walk the talk. Thank you. Ms. Samesh. Thank you to uh, Carl, for, first of all, for bringing this forward and for leading us really in, in doing this. Um, and for all the activists who came to speak about this today, it's certainly a very important topic, uh, and, and teachers and staff. Uh, I do wanna just take a moment to realize that this is a very historic moment for us. Um, I mean, everyone has been saying, right, the largest employer in Virginia is deciding that collective bargaining should be a part of our state policy. Um, so I just kind of want us all to take that in. Um, but, you know, in, in addition, I think uh, I, I appreciated Ms. Tolan mentioning and staff because I want to keep in mind that this is an opportunity for organizing for staff across the board in our school system. You know, from our teachers in our classrooms who are doing the important work uh, of, of obviously making our school system what it is, to our custodians and bus drivers and social workers and, and everyone in between. Um, and it's really something to think about that from the beginning of this country, the freedom of assembly was assured to everyone. Uh, but somehow, we were able, states were able to let these policies sneak in that prevented the, the uh, organizing of working people, right? And, and for causes that are very uh, clearly uh, ones that move us forward. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight that, that really this is such a common sense uh, position that we're taking. And, and as fo folks before me mentioned, it's way overdue. Um, and I hope that we can pressure our colleagues in Richmond who, I don't know if they're listening, but we'll make sure they are. Um, to, to make sure they make the right decisions this term. Um, so thank you to, for our workers who are here today who do the incredible work for everything that you guys are doing, the sacrifices you've made. And I'll close by saying that um, my sister is actually uh, a huge labor activist in Boston who's constantly making sure that I'm on this um, and that I'm up to speed with all the, the, the topics. And, my mo and, I, and I see the struggles of, you know, even my mother who gives up her sleep and is a, co a community college professor um, who is tirelessly working for those students and honestly didn't even realize that a union was there, or I should say an association, was there for her um, to start off and, and, and the importance of, of that um, convening in, in what it was able to do for her and seeing that firsthand. So I thank everyone for what they're doing and I'm excited to be a part of this historic moment. Ms. Sternak Kovacs. Thank you. Um, I do want to say that I will support this. And I know those of you out there, the teachers association leaders who I've worked with for the past eight years, you know I always call you the heart of our system. You know how I feel about you and I feel that the past eight years I've supported you. I will say that I am maybe differing from some of these people. And I'm trying not to, some of the people here on the board because I'm trying not to mix, mix up apples and oranges, but my father was a blue collar worker. He worked for the United Steel Workers Union. And unfortunately, he did not have the same experience as Carl's father did. It was, he was not taken care of by his group. Um, there was no um, help for him and the, he didn't receive a pension. He was too old to invest in a 401, you know, 401k. So my impression of unions from my family's perspective, I think you all deserve to know why I'm reticent in, because otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand my perspective. So I say that to you very honestly, this is very hard for me to talk about. And um, I want you to know that I support you all. I will put my hand up, but I hope it's all that you want because it really wasn't for my family. Okay, so thank you. Ms. Pekarski. Last one, um, I will also support this. Thank you um, uh, to my colleague for bringing this up. Um, at the end of the day, I think we're all here to make sure that our, our children have the best education possible. And part of that is making sure that our educators and those who are in our classrooms doing the hard work every day have a voice um, in, in, in their future. And I am, I am thankful that you're here um, advocating for this. And thank you. I'm going to call for the vote and then offer my comments. So all those in favor of amending the 
legislative plan per Mr. Frisch's motion. Please show your hands. All those in favor? That is unanimous. The motion carries. I was told that by Robert's rules, I should restrain from speaking to a motion until after it's been voted on. So now I'm gonna just provide a couple of comments. It's with great pleasure that I support this, supported this motion. But I also wanted to give a little context. The previous language had been in the legislative plan for over 20 years. I think many people did not even realize it was there, and so we do appreciate the advocacy and um, by our associations to bring this to our attention, and thank you very much for bringing it to our attention. We learn that it's appropriate to revisit, reflect, and be able to amend policies, and that's what we did tonight and I, I'm very supportive of it. But I also want to put it in the context and remind people of what else is in that same section that was amended. It talks about the importance of um, making sure that we communicate with employees well. It also talks about prohibiting discrimination in employment and education based on age, race, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, national origin, marital status, or disability. And amends, talks about amending the code to ensure that we have restorative justice when people have been falsely accused of a crime. Our portrait of a graduate talks about communicators collaborators, consensus building. And that's what collective bargaining does, is it allows greater collaboration, greater opportunities for consensus building on working conditions, salaries, benefits, things like that. But it also, our strategic plan Ignite expects our students to be self-advocates and what we do by what we did by amending the plan was recognize that no greater portrait of an FCPS graduate is a portrait of an FCPS employee. And so I am very grateful to everything each one of our employees do every single day because you are the heartbeat of Fairfax County Public Schools. So it is with great pleasure to see this amendment go through. Thank you. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules, provides for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. 6.01, approve the minutes of the January 9 and January 23, 2020 regular school board meeting. 6.02, authorize the division superintendent and the assistant superintendent, Department of Facilities and Transportation Services, either of whom may act without the other, to take all actions necessary and appropriate in consultation with legal counsel for the school division to pursue approval of the proffered condition uh, amendment application number PCA 89D00702, including negotiating, signing, and submitting the final proffer statement and any other documentation on behalf of the school board. 6.03, award a contract for the Herndon High School synthetic turf field replacement project, practice and stadium fields, to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Sprint Turf LLC, in the amount of $1,060,000, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 
Item 6.04, award a contract for the Westfield High School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, GTR Turf, Inc., in the amount of $651,000 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 6.05, award the contract for the geothermal piping replacement of the Mason Crest Elementary School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Negley's Well Drilling, in the amount of $418,925, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.06, .06, confirm the separations for the period beginning January 1, 2020 and ending January 31, 2020. Item 6.07, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. New business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at, the fu at a future meeting. 7.01, award a contract for the Centerville High School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 7.02, award a contract for the Luther Jackson Middle School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Item 7.03. Consider the renaming of Robert E. Lee High School as outlined in our regulation 8170. Superintendent matters. Next on the agenda is superintendent matters, and I call on Dr. Brabrand. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. A couple of things I want to just share with the board and the community tonight. Uh, we're really happy about two of our schools have gotten the 14 karat gold award. I know you want to know what the 14 karat gold award is. Um, and it's an award given for food safety excellence from the Fairfax County Health Department. And we're proud of Poe Middle School and Poplar Tree Elementary School for being named recipients of these awards. The schools were among nine local food service operations to uh, win the award this year for prioritizing food safety practices and policies, minimizing food waste, and having no critical violations in the past two years. Congratulations to Poe Middle and Poplar Tree Elementary. Um, I also want to bring to your attention, we talk about our great folks in Fairfax County, our exceptional employees as part of our strategic plan. And tonight is no exception. I'm thrilled to share with you that Aaron Harris, who has served as the journalism teacher and advisor at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology since 2008, has been named the 2020 National High School Journalism Teacher of the Year by the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. You can applaud for that. You want to applaud for that? Ms. Harris is the advisor to TJ Today, which is the student newspaper for the school, and also for Techniques, the school yearbook. Both have won national awards, and we were, are so proud of her. She's going to get her national award in March, and one of her students will be selected for a scholarship by the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. So we're really proud of her and we're really proud of the Columbia Scholastic Press Association for recognizing excellence in our staff. And finally, I want to uh, share with you um, something from one of our schools. You know, we keep talking about strategic plan and caring culture, and we can talk about it, but how are we doing it and implementing it in schools? So I just want to share with you that Camelot Elementary has tapped February as acceptance celebration month. Its mission is to, quote, promote the acceptance, the acceptance of all students at Camelot, teach and give students the tools and knowledge they need to fully accept one another, and to encourage and show students how to be a friend to anyone and everyone. Acceptance Month activities include Be a Good Friend Week, featuring an anti-bullying theme, 
a disability awareness event, and a walk in my shoes activity. Acceptance month will culminate with a celebration of the many cultures represented at Camelot. This is just one of many schools doing many things to really create a, a climate of acceptance and inclusion in their schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand. Next on the agenda is board reports, and I call on Ms. Marin for a public engagement committee update, Ms. Keyes Gamara for a report on, from the audit committee, and Mr. Frisch for an update from the governance committee. Ms. Marin. Yes, thank you. I was really pleased to have our first meeting of the public engagement committee, of which I'm chairing, and we have a lot of ideas and energy and we want to do what we can to make sure that the way that we engage the, the community and listen to the community and see that their ideas are acted upon, um, that, that we capture that work and are able to do that work in an effective way. So we were working on just kind of getting our um, ground and figuring out where our priorities were and um, already have identified a few focus areas. One is to um, think about how the public comments work at our board meetings like this one to be sure that people have a fair um, chance and that that works smoothly. One is through another area we want to focus on is engagement of community groups. We know we have a lot of advocates and um, families right here in Fairfax who work together to express their um, needs and concerns to the board and so how can we better engage with them to work with them more regularly. And also to ensure that we are being available on social media. Um, a lot of us like to use that as a, as a forum and so just figuring out how to do that effectively through our newsletters or social media. So those are just a few little steps um, and also um, a, a larger project we're looking at is to see how our advisory committees and our numerous councils and task forces, how they can work effectively to inform the school board's work. We have dozens that we either run or are members on, so that's another uh, area that we're looking to tackle. So more to come. Ms. keyes Gamar. We did, we, we had our second audit meeting and um, I lost my, <laughs> my agenda in front of me, but um, we received an auditor's report on the uh, current audits that have been done from last year, most of which have been completed. Uh, the ongoing one uh, has to do with the local uh, school funds and um, we will be receiving uh, copies of those in an upcoming work session. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Uh, the Governance Committee had its first meeting as well. Um, we made significant progress on updates designed to strengthen our abuse reporting policies and our conflicts of interest policies, and we're hopeful that after the next Governance Committee meeting we'll have some products to bring back to the full board. Um, we also uh, reviewed by acclamation dozens of policies that needed no changes at all. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and uh, we pulled some others off that will need further review. So we're looking forward to the next meeting in March. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Next on the agenda is Board Matters, and I call on Ms. Tolan. Yes, um, I would like to use my Board Matters time to address an item that we had on our consent agenda, um, item 6.02 is in regard to um, the installation of a monopole at Herndon High School. Um, regarding this proposed monopole uh, for the high school, um, my colleague Melanie Marin and myself have been doing um, due, dil due diligence to be sure that our school board policies and regulations regarding this work have been followed. Um, we, did, we posted on board docs a checklist of steps um, that were followed here it is right here. We posted this um, in addition to the information that was already out there um, to the checklist of steps that were followed over the past two years to show that FCPS and our vendor have followed all of the steps necessary to meet the policies and regulations. Um, the school board has been briefed on the application, acted in accordance with school board policy 8335 and is responsive to the wishes of the school principal and the majority of community members. 
Uh, we recently received many emails regarding the monopole, some of them negative and some of them supportive uh, for the installation of the monopole. We will be responding to those emails in the next day or two. And we wish we could have responded earlier to those emails, but our research and discussions with other board members um, took us until late this afternoon. Um, FCPS received an official letter of interest in the spring of 2018 for the construction of this new monopole at the Herndon High School property. FCPS staff met with the respective school board and board of supervisor members to discuss this letter of, of interest, its location and feasibility on the school site. The application was submitted to increase coverage in an area where service is often weak or unavailable and that application is pending. Per school board policy, there was a community engagement process for the monopole application. A public meeting was conducted December 16th, 2019, and was advertised through the distribution of more than 600 postcards and over 300, or over 3,300 emails. In addition, a balloon fly was held to provide the community the opportunity to see the monopole's visual impact and the Herndon High School principal included information about the application in the school's newsletter. There will be another opportunity for public and community participation at the Fairfax County Planning Commission's public hearing for this application, which is scheduled for February 26, 2020. Um, placement of a single monopole at Herndon High School will be visually shielded by surrounding light poles and is preferable to dozens of small cells which service providers can place by right in VDOT right of ways throughout the, the neighborhoods surrounding the high school as we discussed in our um, work session a week and a half ago. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Ms. Seismer Heiser. I hit the wrong button. That's what happens when you come to the school board meetings when you're not feeling well. Um, thank you very much, I appreciate it. It's been a, um, a great couple weeks. The first thing I wanted to mention that I have my second set of office hours coming up um, on Tuesday, February 25th from 6.15 to 8.15 at Woodrow Wilson Library in Falls Church. This will be in the form of a community conversation. We'll just sort of sit and chat about upcoming events and things that are going on right now. Also the next day, Wednesday, February 26th from 9.15 to 11.15 at Caboose Commons, also in Falls Church. Uh, just so you know, as an at-large member, I am trying to have office hours two times each month, um, varying locations around the county, one centrally and one varying to kind of reach as many people as I can, one during the day and one evening or uh, weekend. Um, I just sent out my second newsletter, so hopefully you all got it. Um, I went to the SHAC meeting. I'm the liaison to our Student Health Advisory Committee, and we are focusing on mental health, which is very important to me, is to make sure we educate the whole child. And some of the things that the um, Student Health Advisory Committee are focusing specifically on are brain breaks for our middle school and high school students to make sure they have the breaks that they need to be fully functioning and able to access academics. Um, screen time and our concerns from our communities around screen time and also around adequate sleep. So just a couple things. I just wanted to end with um, one thing that I did. I've been touring and visiting different schools, and I recently went to Rocky Run Middle School, and one of the, the coolest things I saw at Rocky Run was their maker space, and they have a space in their library where they have uh, creative arts and crafts and um, robotics and other things where students can, can really access lessons through in history and English using creative ways to think about what they're doing and using their hands and all sorts of learning techniques. And it was just a very, very um, wonderful way to see portrait of graduate skills in action. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Ms. Marin. Yes, so I um, have continued my tour of schools, um, so much so that I'm on my third cold since taking <laughs> office, but it's otherwise been a joy. Last night I was over at McNair Elementary, which is a pretty exciting place to be right now because they are building a new school on their same plot of land. So um, they're paired schools, of which we have a few in the division. Uh, so the new upper building for the upper grades uh, with the current McNair principal and the 
current building with a new principal who will be starting soon. So um, we also got to learn a little bit about the history of McNair and uh, it was farmland. It was just, it was really cool. So, um, so that was a, a fun moment. I also got to attend what's called the School Lunch Collaborative, of which Fairfax is a part of. Um, yes, and my colleague Ricky and um, Dr. Anderson and Ms. Corbett Sanders were there as well. And um, what it is is a group of food and nutrition service professionals from all over the uh, Northern Virginia and, and Maryland, D.C., so the metro region, talking about not only food quality, but how to improve the school nutrition um, experience. And one big thing I, I learned that I was fascinated about is that if every student bought lunch just one day a week, we could amass so much more revenue that we could continue to improve food quality and offer more options. So I think it'd be neat if, if you know, I know what, for me as a parent, my kids go several times a week, more for my convenience sometimes. But um, and they also have this parfait program going on now where they can build their own parfaits. So it was, it was really exciting. Um, I also attended the Fairfax County Council PTA's meeting quarterly. Uh, they have a quarterly meeting and they did a whole session about their trauma-informed network or uh, programming that's offered. So that's really a great resource that I encourage folks to check out. And um, I'll just say from all of these school visits, the themes that I'm hearing again are um, lots of great things, but again, this, the teacher overwhelm, the overwhelm of staff, um, principals saying they would love to have more flexibility to have you know, even one or two additional staff members working in instruction or behavioral health services. So it really affirmed, or continues to affirm my commitment, especially through this budget process, to see what we can do to make a big difference for our teachers and our students. So um, I will have office hours coming in March, although I've certainly met many community members through these school visits and going to PTA meetings. So please uh, check out my newsletter for that. Thank you. Dr. Anderson. Okay, um, very similarly to Ms. Marin, I have spent the last month really visiting almost every single school in Mason District, and I think I only have about two left after visiting a school today. Um, and unlike her, because I was a teacher, I have fortitude. I have not gotten <laughs> sick. <laughs> It's good to have gotten those germs out of the way years and years ago, but it's really been fabulous to kind of go home again and kind of see the learning at work and to see how things have progressed. Um, but it's also been a little bit disheartening to see the needs of our school, particularly the facilities. Um, we have so many schools that are overcrowded and some of the buildings have aged and have not yet had the opportunity to be renovated and to be maintained. Where's Jeff Plattenberg? Is he back there? <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to making sure that we can address some of those concerns in our CIP. Last week on Valentine's Day, had my first set of office hours. Thank you, Mason District, for coming out and sharing your concerns. Um, I was very happy to be able to have a full house during that period. I have another set of office hours coming up next week on the 27th at Columbia Elementary at 6 p.m. So I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there. Um, Yesterday, I had the opportunity to attend the Fairfax County Athletic Council, FCAC. It's an advisory committee to the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. I am the school board liaison at that meeting. And it was really wonderful to hear how they support the athletic department um, and the work of our um, schools as well. Their focus is on resource management and principal participation in athletic programs. Um, basketball, football, um, soccer, softball, all the major sports are represented. And it's really a great opportunity to see how they support us in FCPS and how we in turn support them by um, the use of the facilities that we have. Um, I'm looking forward to wrapping up my last few school visits and um, to continuing the work. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Um, yes, just quickly, I want to uh, thank the Braddock District Council of Civic Associations for inviting me last week to present the Fairfax County Schools Advertised Budget, uh, where I got to spend about an hour and a half uh, walking through uh, the incredible needs that we have in our school system and uh, outlining and providing more detail about the uh, additional $172 million um, that were, was brought forward by the superintendent and supported by this board. Um, I also had a meeting just the other day with our Fairfax County queued speech translators. Um, for many of you who may not be as familiar with that, uh, Woodson High School uh, 
hosts the Center um, for Acute Speech and American Sign Language, and it was very eye-opening to meet with uh, between 15 and 20 of the educators to talk about the concerns and challenges they have. So I will prepare a summary and um, provide that to the board along with Dr. Um, Braybrand um, to just let you know um, some of the important things that they share with me. Most importantly that it uh, appears Arlington Public Schools is uh, compensating them at almost twice what we are. And while we have a renowned program, uh, the risk is that we're training them here and then we're losing them over to Arlington. They are considered translators, so they are not on a teacher scale. It's a, it's a, a different position. So much more to follow on that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, share with all of you that I'll also provide a summary, it's just a matter of finding the time, right? Um, but I've spent the last two weeks talking with um, my sporadic supervisor, James Walkinshaw's team, as well as Supervisor Harity, uh, as well as one of my principals in the Braddock District, um, and also the Director of Neighborhood and Community Services, Chris Leonard, uh, because as many of you may be aware, um, our, our school-age um, child care program, better known as SAC, um, the wait lists are quite problematic in parts of the county, and so uh, I'm going to uh, bring forward a proposal uh, that if I have to do it through a form because that's the process, I will, but I would like to see something a little more timely. But I just wanted to make you all aware that that summary would be coming because uh, we have not updated um, our signed memorandum since 1987. That's the most signed memorandum. And I want to thank Mr. Plattenberg's shop. Um, you had two of your staff members who uh, spoke with me at length as well about their knowledge of where we are. And I just want to close on a positive note that I do believe that there is a lot of, of interest on the parts of the Board of Supervisors um, as well as um, I know here on the board as well. And I, what I'd like to just see is we get a, a shared plan in place uh, so we can really have something to help our families by the next uh, school year in the fall. And uh, finally, I just want to um, spotlight the substitute shortage issue. Uh, I, I really am concerned. I know we keep talking about it, um, but Dr. Braybrand, I just thought it bears repeating. I am hearing from teachers all over the county. It's almost the number one thing they keep bringing up is our shortages reached an all-time high and the impact of having principals stepping in and teaching classes because there just simply aren't the substitutes. Uh, I think we're going to need to have a very intentional action plan um, sooner rather than later. So I see everybody's tired, so I'm done. Ms. Derenak Kovacs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have had the pleasure uh, over the past few weeks of attending the Edison um, PTSA meeting. Um, I also uh, attended the meeting of the Advanced Academic Program Advisory Council, for which I am the liaison. And um, I also attended the Forest Dale's new principal, uh, Forest Dale Elementary School um, new principal selection um, meeting. So thank you to everyone who's come out to each of those meetings. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. And um, we also, for Forest Dale, we can continue to get your feedback and please send that in to us as we um, bid farewell to our wonderful principal who's moving on to another um, school in our district. In the coming weeks, I look forward to um, uh, w attending the Wilton Woods Community Association meeting where I'll talk about the schools and what's coming up um, on our, in um, our uh, budget. And also I'm looking forward to seeing Oz, the spring musical at Rose Hill Elementary School. That's always a treat. And um, finally, um, a little bit of heads up, you, this will come out tonight to uh, community members and um, in a, a press information that on March 11th at 7 o'clock p.m. will be the first community meeting um, to discuss the renaming of Lee High School. Ms. Keyes-Gamar. 
Thank you. I am going to give a summary. Um, it's difficult to cover all the weeks that we've been here. Um, I did, uh, we had a Title I meeting uh, with all of our schools, and which was excellent. I am always appreciative of the parents that come out to make sure that their schools are informed. And uh, this meeting was focused on understanding um, uh, trauma-based, uh, tr creating trauma-based schools. And so, uh, trauma-informed, thank you. Um, so at any rate, I also had an opportunity to attend, let me take my glasses off to read this, um, the Minority Parents for Excellence in Education for Lake Braddock Secondary School had Lawrence Jackson, who was an author and photographer who worked for, during the Obama administration. Uh, so he was there signing uh, books uh, that brought back wonderful memories. And they are having another event for Black History Month on February 29th, uh, where they will be having a concert and fundraiser. So please go to their website so that you can participate in that. And I will be having office hours at the Chantilly Library on uh, February 27th from 5 to 6.30. Thank you. Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. I, too, have uh, continued my tour of schools, and I'm having a wonderful time um, just getting to know teachers, administrators, and our students, and, and seeing all the wonderful learning that's going on across the Sully District. Um, I will be hosting a joint budget town hall at the Sully Government Center on March 4th with Supervisor Kathy Smith. So I, I do want to invite uh, citizens to come out. I do want to connect with you and hear your priorities and hear your thoughts on uh, as, as we begin a more um, detailed budget cycle uh, coming up in the next few months. I also had the opportunity to go to the Westfield PTSA meeting uh, from an invitation, and we had um, a good conversations about FCPS on, about the budget, about the AAP review that will be coming. So I appreciate everybody who came out to share their thoughts. And I, um, I look forward to the coming month. I still have quite a few schools I'm getting to, so I look forward to those visits. Thank you. Ms. Humesh. Thank you. Um, plenty of visits and meetings of all sorts. I wanted to highlight uh, one in particular. As our student representative mentioned earlier, that mental health is a priority on students' minds and has been called a crisis. Um, I certainly uh, am looking into this as I've, as I've promised um, over the past two years, I guess. Um, and I had the opportunity of meeting with uh, Teresa Johnson and her team, um, as well as a number of students to discuss ways that we um, would love to see additional supports in the schools. Uh, and I'm really excited to see where we can take that, um, perhaps if we can make it in time, uh, into this budget, we'll see. And I urge my colleagues to look out for an amendment soon. Uh, I am happy to announce that Part of the mental health effort, as some of you know, um, in my work at the Public Policy School um, at Georgetown, I recently won a public policy challenge competition um, and is moving into the next phase where we may have the opportunity um, to have pro bono supports uh, on really professionalizing what kind of program and looking at best practices and data-based uh, uh, opportunities um, of how we can improve the condition of uh, mental health struggles in our schools. So I just wanted to put that on everyone's radar. I will be updating folks. Um, and then beyond that, of course, you all know how to reach me. I think it's pretty accessible. I know my number has been flying around and I've been hearing from so many of you um, and I've heard from, uh, from you guys, social media, email, continue to be in touch. I hope to be accessible to everyone. Um, I will be uh, coming to schools as I have been already. The most recent I've been to is Justice, and I had such a pleasure spending quite a bit of time in a number of classrooms. Um, so shout out to the school where I also met Dr. Ivy's wonderful husband, uh, who works as a teacher there and does a great job. Um, but in any case, I look forward to hearing from you guys and continuing uh, to maintain a relationship. Thank you. Ms. Cohen. This week I had the honor of getting to visit Hunt Valley Elementary School and Rolling Valley Elementary School. Um, and with the awesome Region 5 team, I got to help kick off the principal selection process at Greenbrier East Elementary School. Today I was so excited to get to go to Keene Mill Elementary School where we honored the Region 4 Outstanding Professional Employee of the Year, Dr. Trailer, 
and then got to surprise the Region 4 Outstanding Secondary Teacher, Ms. Raglan, at Lake Braddock Secondary School. Congrats to both of those amazing educators for very well-deserved honors. Um, I also just want to take the opportunity to give a personal thank you to my board colleagues, the school board office, um, school board office staff, everyone at FCPS for their support and the extra work that they took on uh, this last week as uh, my family and I dealt with the loss of my dad. I don't want Tammy to be the only one to cry this week. <laughs> um, your calls, texts, cards, and hugs are appreciated beyond measure, so thank you. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, before I jump into some Providence business, uh, Elaine and I had our first uh, meeting of the Joint Environmental Task Force with the County Board of Supervisors and uh, community um, supporters and, and um, folks interested in helping us to uh, fight climate change and uh, move towards environmental sustainability. Um, breaking into subcommittees on issues like transportation, recycling and waste, uh, workforce, a number of, of sub-issues, and we're looking into what the current practices are and where we can find uh, opportunities to work together. So that's exciting work that we're continuing. Um, since, our la since my last check-in at a board meeting, I've been to Stenwood Elementary, Davis Center, Marshall High School, Shrevewood, Mosby Woods, Marshall Roads, Oakton High School, uh, I think Marshall High School, I don't know if I mentioned that already, it's a list. Um, yeah, we had our first coffee with Carl um, and there was lots of coffee. It was great. Um, and we have our first office hours on February 27th. Uh, that's next Thursday. Uh, two shifts, one in the morning, one in the evening. So whichever one you can make it to, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, or 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Oakton Library. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. So um, I had the pleasure of attending the Bryant graduation. And I also attended something that was really unique. It's called Signature in the Schools. And it's a play that um, is put on annually at Signature Theater, written by a local author and uh, performed by students in Arlington, Alexandria and Fairfax County schools, all public school students who come together uh, and perform this once a year, and it was just a fantastic uh, opportunity. Um, going forward, I'm looking forward to being with all of my colleagues tomorrow for our school board retreat, and on Saturday is the Facility Planning Advisory Committee retreat, um, and then on Sunday are the Student Peace Awards followed by on the um, 3rd of March, we have Eyes Up, Phones Down coming, uh, which is going to be a great uh, event in collaboration with the Communities of Trust to educate our students and the community on safe driving and putting away those cell phones as they drive. So I encourage people to go to the end zone in Chantilly for that event. And I look forward to, on the same day, March 3rd, being with the Mount Vernon High School PTSA, where my colleague, Abra Amesh, will be with me. And then uh, the next night, we will be at the Mount Vernon Council of Civic Associations Education Committee with Dr. Nardis King. And so uh, it's going to be a busy couple of weeks, but I'm looking forward to spending a lot of time with my colleagues, uh, both on the board and within FCPS. And with that, this meeting is now going to go back into closed session. So I will make the motion. The board will now make a motion to go into closed meeting to discuss and consider disciplinary and other matters concerning one or more students pursuant to Section 2.2.3711A2 of the Code of Virginia. Do I have a motion? Motion by, made by Ms. Omesh, seconded by Ms. Tolan. All those in favor? Uh, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser? That motion carries, it's unanimous, thank you.